second uh, the second uh, part of the talk conversation is about base layer protocols. So base layer protocols are not utility tokens. Base layer protocols are like Ethereum or like, let's say, Bitcoin, right? Where somebody's mining something, so they need to be incentivized. Or, you know, somebody's validating something on the network, they need to be incentivized. So the incentive for the token is very different from a utility token, where the token only exists as a, you know, uh, price marker for buying and selling goods and services. So this is based on three different areas of study, and there's a lot of research that's already done on this. The first is game theory, which models the interactions between various actors in a system. The second is called mechanism design, right, which looks at the rules of the game. How do you define the rules of the game, right? And the third is market design, which is to efficiently manage the market. So a lot of the base layer protocols are based on these three different, you know, theories. A lot of work that's already done on game theory, Nash equilibrium, and things like that, right? So, so a lot of tokens that are coming out are looking at some of these theories to meaningfully model uh, their tokens. So game theory provides a structured language that helps in analyzing interactive situations, right? Like for example, let's get into the exact um, uh, prisoner's dilemma, right? There are two prisoners. Uh, two conspirators who've been caught by the police. Okay, so there are four different scenarios right now. So if prisoner A or B cooperates, he gets no jail term. He goes free. But other person gets a jail term of three years. Right? So if prisoner A stays silent and prisoner B stays um, silent, right? If, if he they cooperate with each other, they each get one year jail term. If prisoner A, right, he cooperates and prisoner B betrays, which basically means he goes to the police and tells them the story about prisoner A, then prisoner B goes free. So this is very important because at the end of the day in the blockchain network, the success of the blockchain network is based on different actors behaving in a rational way or incentivizing actors to act in a rational way. You don't want different actors to attack the Bitcoin network or Ethereum network, right? So if you attack the network, the network goes down. So we need to incentivize people. So game theory models are used to look at and understand how to incentivize actors. So the prisoner's dilemma is a classical game theory model to understand how to you know, incentivize good behavior. So then in uh, situation two, the prisoner A betrays, right? He goes and tells, um, the police that prisoner B was a culprit and then he walks free. Prisoner B gets three years. And, uh, and in uh, scenario four, in the right quadrant, you have um, each serve two years, right? Because both of them remain silent and both of them get the jail term. So, so which, sorry, which prisoner A betrays uh, prisoner B and prisoner B betrays prisoner A and then both of them get this. So the dominant strategy in this game is for the prisoners to betray each other because they don't want a jail term. But the Nash equilibrium, right, which is, which is basically the outcome from which each player could only do worse by unilaterally changing their strategy, right? Mutual defection is strong, right? Which is the Nash equilibrium in the game. So, so the idea here is how do you incentivize different actors who are part of a blockchain or Bitcoin network to behave in a meaningful, rational manner. How do you incentivize them so they don't break the network? Because you don't have institutions in the traditional sense managing your money. You have actors on the network managing your money, right? So game theory models are like this, where you have different types of actors, different types of strategies, different types of scenarios. You basically model these scenarios, model the outcomes, and then try and find incentives uh, by which you make people act in a meaningful way. The second one is called mechanism design, right? So mechanism design is a field of economics. It's called reverse game theory because you start at the bottom and then work your way on the top, right? Because you look at the outcome and then you model the game uh, based on that. So the goal is to arrive at, you know, solutions where you have equilibrium, uh, you know, uh, situations in a, in a particular game. But let's look at a specific example so you understand it. So there's a mother, and the mother has cooked a cake for the children, right? There's a boy and a girl, 
and you want to do a mechanism design. So in this mechanism design, the optimal thing is that none of the children should feel that they're getting less or more. They should feel just. So the mother doesn't want to cut the cake because if she cuts small or large, then there'll be a fight. So what you do is you create a mechanism by which the child one, which cuts the cake, will cut the cake, and child two will be the person to choose the pieces. Right? So this is a very simple example of mechanism design. Because in a network, you want to make sure that the act actors, different actors in the network feel that they are, their actions are justified, right? I mean, their incentives, their bonuses, so on and so forth are justified in a meaningful manner. So mechanism design is at the crux of some of the things that we see in, uh, in uh, crypto economics. The third one is market design, which is designing efficient markets. It's both a, both a science and an art, and, uh, and we'll see why, right? So one of the main things with market design is getting equilibrium price, right? So how do we get, what is the right equilibrium in which uh, the price can stabilize? The third is the price recipe. I mean, is it, the, is it the same for all markets or is it different for different markets, right? And how will the price uh, affect people's decisions, right? I mean, will it, uh, you know, change their perception about the, the token? Will they, you know, go to a different protocol, so on and so forth? So these are the three key tenets of market design. When you do a market design for a protocol token, you look at something called as market thickness. So you need to have enough participants, right? So this is one of the things why people do an airdrop. They want as many token holders as possible. So market thickness, right? And you, want, you don't want one single large investor to hold on to your tokens because then they'll start manipulating the price. So market thickness is key. Second is avoiding congestion, right? So you want to have enough actors uh, to trade efficiently in a, in a market. And third, of course, is making the market safe from bad actors, right? So speculators and so on. So what, how are people doing this in a meaningful way today in the crypto economics world? The first one, of course, increasing thickness, you do mining, right? When people mine, they get their tokens. The second is through partnerships. Then third is referral bonuses. Right, so we've seen this in the market today. The second one is transaction fees, right? When uh, there's too much condition in the network, what do you do? Your gas price goes up. Yes, no? Ethereum gas price goes up. And the membership deposits, that's another way. It's called staking rewards. You can also allow people to do staking and then reduce the network condition. The third one is providing safety through governance, smart contracts, you know, you have UIS, which has got validators, the validator concept, right? So these are the ways to efficiently design a protocol to you know, function the most efficient way. And of course, in a crypto ecosystem, there's levels of coordination. So you know, people have to coordinate, they have to mine, they have to budget the cost of attacks. Like let's say there's a bad actor, he wants to come and attack, see you who go. So, and then you have incentives for different actors. And then you have different types of attack models, right? I mean, it could be a 15 person attack, it could be a zeitgeist attack. There are so many different ways when you participate in the network, when the network can be attacked and uh, taken down, right? So, and of course, there's a consensus mechanism as well, right? So, so there's one area which game theory is very useful, which is managing the integrity of the network, right? But what it fails to do, of course, is quantum attacks, right? You can have quantum networks and things like that. That's another area. I'm hoping to do another talk on it uh, one day on the impact of quantum computing and on not just attacking networks but also breaking the ciphers. When you do it at that level, then it actually becomes useless. So the incentives for people to act rationally is, of course, mining rewards. We have privileges where you have privileged actors. You get validator status. So how many of you here have uh, seen Polkadot, the model, Polkadot model? Right, so they basically incentivize good actors based on behavior on the network and they have higher status. So, so incentive dictates the behavior of the participants and a decentralized system, right? So they get, if you behave better, you get more and more rewards and you become more powerful in the network. So different attack models exist. So participants make independent choices. And so what you do is like, for example, uh, Bitcoin, there's something called a proof of work, 51% attack where 15% of the people can actually choose to 
agree to a different version of the blockchain, right? But there's a price involved to do that. To do one hour Bitcoin attack, you have to spend half a million dollars. And this was like almost six, seven months ago. Now it's probably much higher, right? And you have something called a selfish mining attack. Anybody knows what a selfish mining attack is? Exactly. So what happens is not the coins. What you do is you do not validate the block, but you go and validate the next block instead of, you know, so that's the selfish mining thing. So what happens is once you discover a block, you announce that on the network. So after you discover the block, you don't announce it, and then you wait for the next block, you discover it, and then you announce a new block on the longest chain. So it becomes more expensive for that attack. So very good point. The third one is a zeitgeist attack, right, which basically... So, as you know, if you have an older timestamp, you get more rewards, right? So you can manipulate the timestamp, and then you can do the attack. So what are the key takeaways from this session, right? So the final session is security token, so we'll take a five-minute break after this. But what are the key takeaways from a protocol design perspective? Understand the different actors and incentive structures. Very important, right? Who are the actors? Because a lot of protocols are getting attacked, left, right, and center. Right, we see it in the news almost every, it's become like a weekly thing now. I mean, new protocols getting attacked. Game theorized interactions, it's very important to understand game theory if you want to be a protocol designer. Right, so a lot of these guys are technology guys who don't have any economics background. So I would recommend reading those uh, books on uh, game theory models, which, which is very important. The third is mechanism design, as you saw, right? So you, need, you want to, you know, be a rational actor, you want to provide the right incentives, you want to have, you know, promote participation. And of course, you want to facilitate the right market design for the interaction between the tokens. So with that, we, in session two, we'll take a five, 10 minute quick break before we go into the most exciting security token offering valuations. Thank you for listening patiently.